Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. I'm excited to have Belinda Alexander joining me today. Hi Belinda. Hi, how are you Jackie? Good, thanks. Uh, just a bit about um, Belinda before we start getting into questions and everything. So Belinda's the author of nine best-selling novels and has sold more than one million copies of her books worldwide. She is the daughter of a Russian mother and an Australian father and has been an intrepid traveller since her youth. Belinda is the patron of the World League for Protection of Animals and lives in Sydney with her three rescue cats, Valentino, Versace and Gucci, and a garden full of interesting wildlife. I'd um, be interested to hear a little bit more about that. I've got um, three foster puppies at the moment. Oh, how gorgeous. Yeah, so, well, you probably can see the ear of Gucci. Oh, yes. There <laughs> and I think Valentino let out a meow when you mentioned his name. So oh, he's cute. cute. <laughs> and um, Belinda's latest book is The French Agent, and I've got a copy of mine here. And just want to mention, I finished reading it, I think, two nights ago, and really, really loved it. It's the first book of yours I've read and um, we'll certainly be looking out for some more to read. So just wondering if you want to start off by telling us a bit about The French Agent. Yeah, um, look, it's set in 1946, and I would describe it as a historical emotional thriller um, or a psychological thriller. And um, what happens is it opens in Paris and Sabine is a war crimes investigator and she's on the trail of a man who she believes betrayed the resistance uh, circuit that she was in um, during the war and resulted in the death of um, not only her colleagues, but her family as well. Uh, meanwhile, across the other side of the globe, uh, Diana White, who's a um, pioneering landscape designer, is waiting for her husband, Casper, to return from the war. But the man who returns is not the man that she remembers. He's darker, he's more secretive. And as the story goes on, we can see that uh, Sabine is actually chasing Casper White, but we're sort of always guessing, is Casper actually the traitor or not? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, with Sabine determined for revenge and Diana White determined to save her family, when uh, these two women clash, there's um, sure to be fireworks. Yeah. Yeah. And just also want to mention that thanks to HarperCollins, anyone watching the Facebook Live, if you've got a question for Belinda, um, just type it in comments and you'll have a chance to win your own copy of the French agent. So just wondering if you want to start off by telling us, I'm really interested to know, is anything, like what made you first think of this story? Is there anything in true life that you heard about or? Yeah, look, it's really funny how ideas come, um, you know, for a book. Like we sort of wish the doorbell would go and we'd open the front door and there would be a courier with our book all nicely laid out for us. But I describe it more like a merry-go-round, sort of a merry-go-round goes round and first you'll get an idea of the place you want to set the book and then maybe the time you want to set the book and you get these vague ideas of characters. So each one sort of joins uh, differently. But with the French agent, I think um, I have a fascination. I mean, there's a lot of books written about the Second World War and the French resistance during the Second World War. And I was just really curious about what happens after a war, in the aftermath, mm. because in France, you definitely had the um, position of some people had sided with the Germans within France and denounced their own neighbours. And then you had people who'd actually actively resisted. And so after the Second World War, how do those people, you know, reconcile with each other? And um, then also Australia was in a very, very different position uh, because we didn't experience uh, war on our soil and mm -hmm. yet you know over a million Australians had served in the Second World War and how did they come back to a country that had basically not really changed mm -hmm. but they changed mm -hmm. enormously and I think sadly history shows that we didn't deal very well with our returned uh, war veterans and you know that their families were basically given responsibility for their mental health, which mm. is just 
possible. Uh, so I, I think that's really where my sort of uh, concept of, you know, the French agent came from is, you know, after the war and after all the tanks and the soldiers have gone home, what, what really happens then? Yeah, no, that's a great concept. And um, do you, did you have any people who like might have experienced something similar or maybe their family members had and they reached out to you once your book had been published? Uh, with, um, uh, I think, uh, with trauma, I've done mm. quite a bit of research into trauma and I did speak, I do, do have, uh, women amongst my friends, older women who had fathers that mm. were extremely damaged by mm. the second world war and their stories of what their fathers went through and what it was like being in a family like that. And I think, you know, what really struck me about um, this period in history is basically the responsibility was put on the wives mm. to, you know, these mm. men were highly traumatised mm. and these women were basically really indoctrinated to believe, well, if you're a nice uh, wife who keeps the house clean and makes nice biscuits, that's going to make everything yeah. <laughs> right. And it's not going to solve uh, post-traumatic uh, mm. stress disorder. And, I just thought how lonely for those women mm. to have that responsibility put on their shoulders because anyone that's dealt with a relative that has a mental health issue knows how draining, how frightening mm. and how unpredictable the situation can be and how lonely it can be. But at least we sort of at least recognise that even if people don't get always get the support they, they need, we have a recognition of that. Whereas these women really just didn't have that... Um, you know, recognition. And I might just tell you a, a strange story that came out of my research that mm. illustrates it is um, a lot of um, my research, I try and read first hand material to try and get an idea of how people were actually thinking at the time rather than an interpretation of us looking back. And so I read a lot of the newspapers. And so I was reading a lot of the Australian newspapers 1946. And I came across this advertisement. I think it was for some deodorant. I can't remember the brand. It might have been Nivea deodorant. And it was one of those cartoon advertisements. And in it, a woman will call her Betty. Um, her husband comes home from war and he is constantly at the pub with his mates. He won't stay with her and she's heartbroken. And of course, a lot of men were going to the pub with their mates because it was a mm. way of self-medicating mm. their, their trauma. Um, but she's heartbroken by it. And one day she's gardening and she hears her two neighbours talking over the hedge as that's how you discover everything when neighbours talking over the hedge. But one woman's saying to another, oh, if only Betty would use the right deodorant, her husband would stay at home. And of course, in the next thing, Betty goes out and buys the deodorant and she uses the deodorant and suddenly Bob, her <laughs> husband, loves her again and everything's solved. And I really looked at it and I thought that would really be doing women's head. Yeah. And in many ways, we're still doing women's mm. head. We're, we're still making them responsible for things that they have. They really can't control, mm. whether it's sexual assault or domestic violence. We're still, you know, blaming women or putting too much responsibility on them. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought there was a way to relate my research to things that we perhaps feel now. Yeah, yeah. No, that's crazy. That ad in the... <laughs> <laughs> if only we could solve all our problems. Yeah. I actually have another funny story to tell you is that um, I know when I was a writer, I was rejected for 10 years mm. before I got published. Mm. And each of those rejections was really painful. Mm. But when I was researching um, uh, about trauma, um, I, it was interesting that um, I found this recent research that said feelings of rejection and heartbreak and failure, if you take an aspirin, it actually relieves some of the emotional pain because oh, really? when we're rejected and we feel pain, mm. it actually lights up the same parts of our brain that actually hurt with physical hurt. Mm. And I thought if only I knew <laughs> all those years of rejection, I could have like softened the pain with some aspirin. Yeah, it's really interesting <laughs> to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> And one thing that I found in your book, I mean, it's something we probably knew, but it just 
so brought it home to me a bit is how much um like the men were sort of probably told not to talk about anything as well yes look you know there's two sides to that um one they 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 were traumatized and they needed mm. um help the interesting thing that they now have done studies in trauma is that it's neurological more than psychological mm. it's the result of being just under constant stress and you've probably seen you know those those old black and white films of the men who came back from the first world war with shell shock and they're shaking and and mm. all of that so it's a neurological um, issues so they actually have found that talking about trauma too much is not good mm. uh, for you mm. because it makes you relive the the trauma it's different to grief where sometimes talking it out can be uh, therapeutic mm. um, but the fact that there was no mental health um, support or understanding that the men of course felt isolated as well mm. they're having nightmares they don't know why they're being constantly triggered they don't feel like themselves and they don't feel that they're in a country where people can understand their experience. Mm. And probably another reason for men to get together in a pub, because at least even if they didn't talk about what happened, yeah. they who could, had been there too. Yeah. Mm. Understand. Um, so, yeah, I think it was just a whole, it was just so difficult for everybody because of the lack of understanding that, you know, just come home and mow your lawn and get a mm. job and everything will be all right mm. again. Mm. And we've got quite a few people watching. So just wanted to remind the people watching that thanks to HarperCollins, if you've got a question for Belinda, please type it in comments and I can read it out and you'll have a chance to win a copy of the French Agent. Um, I've got a question from Belinda. She wonders if all of your books are historical fiction. Uh, well, I've actually written uh, two non-fiction books. Mm. So I've written one on cats, which is not uh, fiction. That's actually a story of the history of women and cats and also has some memoir of my life with cats. Oh, wow. Um, so, and I've got one uh, coming out as well, which is a mixture in April, it's called Emboldened, and it's a mixture of uh, my own uh, memoir mm. and also four women who've influenced my writing. Oh, that but sounds one, good, yeah. It, but for my novels, um, they are, um, yes, they are mainly historical fiction, although a couple of them come close to what we would say is more closer to contemporary fiction. So um, Southern Ruby, for instance, goes right up until um, Hurricane Katrina mm. in uh, New Orleans. So that's 2005, although that's that's a few years ago now. But um, that, that probably wouldn't be considered um, pure historical mm. fiction. Mm. Right? It's more recent um, mm. history. And um, I think apart from that, it was Golden Earrings had um, half of the book set in the 1970s, which would also be considered more recent fiction, although also that's that's a long time ago. Yeah. I guess there were many people watching who weren't born in the mm. 70s, so that would probably mm. feel historical for them. Yeah, I wonder um, how far back they actually officially call historical. Well, interesting, it used to be, like, if uh, when I was writing about modern history, mm. it wasn't really considered historical fiction. Historical fiction was really when you were going back a couple of hundred mm. um, years or, or, or more. But I've noticed in terms of the genre, it really does include World War II um, mm. history. That would still be considered um, historical fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's become a broader genre than, yeah, than it was considered maybe a decade ago. Mm -hmm. And um, Kim says it's so interesting to think about the aftermath of the war. It is definitely not explored as much as um, wartime stories. Yeah, well, look, I ha I come from a, a family that my mother was a white Russian born in China. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather had to flee the, the Russian Revolution. He basically rode out of Russia on a horse into China. Oh. And that's where my mother was born. So that's the stories that I've grown up with. So my whole family's direction was changed mm. by wars and revolutions. Mm. So I guess that's why I'm fascinated not only by the war and revolution itself, 
but really how people's lives are completely changed and and turned upside down my mother ended up in Australia and I guess she never expected that mm. and uh, my grandfather was at university actually during the Russian Revolution he was expecting to go to university and get his degree he wasn't expecting to you know have to join the white army uh, ride with the cavalry mm. <laughs> then end up in in China so um, I was actually thinking about that this morning why do we go to war mm. waste of mm time and and life yeah and, exactly. and then in the end and they always burn out and we're just left with this chaos mm. to deal with we really need to have war prevention mm. better war prevention mm. yeah mm. And um, Kelly says she loves how you take a historical event and turn it into a thriller. She wonders if you know the twists before you start writing. Well, um, it's really interesting because during lockdown, I did a, um, a master's class in screenwriting. Okay. Actually with people who were actually working in the industry and had... Um, you know, experience of screenwriting. So I was just amazed at how much planning mm. they do before they even start writing because they basically have two hours to tell a story. They yeah. don't you know, have a book, but they mm. can meander over it. So they um, really uh, have to put thought into every scene, into every detail and the timing of when things happened. And so after um, I did that class, I really thought a lot more about planning uh, my novels ahead of time. And so I did probably think about the twists more and where to actually put them and mm. how often to put them. Um, because I love that in a, a story. I love it when I think I'm going one way and then the writer has actually plotted all these things so that when the book suddenly changes direction, what's happened before, all makes sense yeah like, oh, why didn't i see that yeah, uh, yeah. and yeah. that's i think that's kind of exciting so i love putting that in um the book i particularly love putting that in the french agent because of the way i was i was plotting it yeah so, yeah yeah yeah, and Kelly also says your books cover so many different historical periods is there one that is your favorite historical period uh you know, I kind of enjoy uh, living in each period that I'm writing about. I get mm -hmm. very absorbed. I listen to the music of the period. Mm -hmm. I read the novels of um, the time. I really get very immersed in them. Um, when I was writing Gold Earrings, you know, it was about flamenco. I started to look like a flamenco dancer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I took out flamenco lessons. Um, so there, I... I I've enjoyed them all, but I think the one that I like the most is probably Paris in the 1920s. Yeah. Because I just, in my mind, in my imagination, mm. it would have been wonderful to have been a writer in Paris in that period with all those ideas and all those interesting people mm. sort of converging in the one place. But then when I think about the reality is people were probably freezing in their little studios in winter that's why they hung around the cafes because their rooms weren't heated yeah <laughs> and um sort of dealing without all the modern conveniences that we enjoy mm. and either having to write out my book by hand or to type it on a manual yeah <laughs> yeah that would have been yeah <laughs> yeah may not have been as glorious as i imagine yeah and have you had the chance to visit a lot of the locations that your books are based on? Yes, look, it's always um, an excuse to travel. So my friends sometimes joke, you always set your book where you want to go. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, well, why not? Like you're going to spend an enormous amount of time, even in your head, writing that book. But it was interesting again during lockdown when none of us could travel. Mm. And I really had to go back in my imagination, um, you know, to those places and have to, have to, um, really not rely on seeing so much and, and thinking about things um, a bit more. So you can actually do uh, both, but I think it always does help to lend that sort of authentic air to a, a, a novel yeah. if you can be there. Mm. But if somebody's just starting out and writing and they're just not in a position to do that, mm. I just think if you make it up with the research and you watch lots of films and you 
you can go on Google Maps and you can walk through the city streets yourself and you can do a lot of things if you're not in a position to travel and yet mm. you have a desire to write about it mm. in other ways. Mm. Mm. And um, Kim wonders if there's a topic or era that you have always wanted to write about, but you haven't yet. Oh, gosh, that's a good question, Kim. I, yeah, there probably is. Like, I think I would love to write um, about South America. Like, mm. I would love to set a book. Mm. It's, and it's such a, you know, very, the, all the different countries are varied. Um, but they have such an interesting history and such a rich culture as well. And um, after my grandfather fled to China, he actually had, was, Stalin actually sent an assassin for him. Mm. So he had to escape to Brazil. And oh, wow. I just, I just think that would, so I guess I have a, a, a reason, a family connection as well to think, yeah, I'd like to um, spend some time in Brazil and perhaps write a story set there as well. Sounds like you've got a very interesting family history as well. Is that something you've wanted to write about, maybe? Well, actually, my first book, White Gardenia, mm -hmm. um, that's written 20 years ago now, um, actually came out of asking my mother questions about my family history. Mm -hmm. And that story actually came um, to me then. So, yes, I was lucky. I mean, at the time when I was a child growing up in Australia, my mother seemed very unusual because... She spoke five languages and oh, one, of wow. them, one of them was Mandarin. Mm. And, you know, this Russian woman who can speak Mandarin. <laughs> and I thought, I, I don't know many people that can do that. Mm. So I thought she was kind of magical. Mm. Um, but she did, you know, she had so many interesting stories and she was a good storyteller as well. Mm. Um, so I definitely you know, became fascinated with my family history and, and she encouraged me to be a writer as well. Mm. Um, she was one of the few people that thought writing was a serious profession. Yeah. <laughs> so I was lucky to have her support. As yeah, well. that's great. You got that encouragement from her. Mm. And what are you working on at the moment? Um, Kelly wonders when your next book will come out as well. Uh, well, I've got my um, nonfiction book, Emboldened, is going to be out this April in Australia and New Zealand. Um, and then the next uh, fiction book that I'm working on is around, um, uh, is set in, in Paris again, just after the Second World War. And it's um, about, uh, you know, an art dealer who's basically trying to find his stolen, his stolen art, his mm. art that was stolen from him. So there's a bit of a mystery, um, yeah, there as well. So that's what I'm currently working on. Mm. Mm, no, sounds great. And could you tell us a bit about what you like reading yourself and if maybe there's something you've read lately that you'd like to recommend to us? Yeah, look, I um, I love to um, read. And this summer I do did get a bit of a break, a bit of a chance to, mm. to read some extra books. So I've just got, um, let's see, well, first I'm a, a Natasha Lester fan mm. we are um good friends we often um uh, we both love each other's books mm. so we like to um read each other's books and um, we like similar things we like um the detail of history she's really into fashion and she describes that very well i like fashion too i'm really into the interiors and architecture and art as well so i can highly recommend this this is a, a very enjoyable um, book the riviera house um Strangely, I didn't read this when this oh, came out. Oh, okay. Then you've read, yeah. And um, this is really gripping. Mm. You know, I did see the movie, but I never, never actually read the book. So, um, yeah, it, you know, this kind of thriller is not a book that I would normally read. Mm. But I just thought, you know what, do something a bit different. <laughs> and this one I got to read in advance. So this is an exciting one. This is coming out. It will be sometime this year. But it's um, by Kim E. Anderson, and um, it's called The Prize, and it's about the Archibald Prize in 1943 and um, the controversy that was around uh, the the judge's decision oh, okay. to who awarded the prize to mm. and how um, it really destroyed the, the artists mm. emotionally. 
because there was, as you know, with art, we like to think it's all wonderful and mm. glorious and everything, but there's always politics going on. Mm. And um, so there's a lot about the politics behind an art prize as well. So um, I, I can't, I don't know the release date, but it will be, what is it? Oh, it's April. So this okay. is coming out in April too. Yeah. So um, that's one to enjoy if you love art mm. and um, history. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for those recommendations. We always love getting recommendations. I'm, I'm wondering if you could tell us, if you could be a character in any of your books for a day, who would you choose and why? Oh, goodness me. That's um, that's quite a difficult one because uh, my characters go through very difficult yes. <laughs> situations, so I'd have to pick a day where, where things were going well for them. But if I'm really going to be honest about that, um, the characters would be one of my cats from the Divine Feline because I think they have a pretty good <laughs> life without any worries. They don't have to do any work. Yeah. Um, you know, everything is served to them. They don't even have to clean up after themselves. So they've got staff. Yeah, so, that sounds like a good yeah, choice. Out of all the characters. <laughs> And do you want to tell us a little bit about um, the World League for the Protection of Animals? Yeah, look, that's a small um, charity in Sydney. And I actually met them, uh, these, these three boys, my cats are actually former street cats. Mm. I actually discovered them one Easter. Somebody had dumped a pregnant female mm. cat and she had kittens. And then, then their kittens had kittens, and there was this growing little population of cats around my supermarket. And I had been a wildlife carer, and I just knew that this was going to be bad news because cats, you know, multiply like rabbits. Mm -hmm. And then um, people would be cruel to them. Some people are kind, but there's always cruel people around, and they would be very vulnerable where they were. And I thought, this situation is only going to get worse. So I had... Um, uh, some uh, brush tail possum humane traps and so I actually trapped the cats and I put them through finishing school because they were quite wild but to do all of that I had to be under the branch of a uh, you know uh, authorized charity mm. and that's how I met the world league and, and the, the hard things that they do and so um, that's really that's really what they do is a small little charity in Sydney that helps uh, street cats mm. No, sounds um, very rewarding. <laughs> well, thanks so much for chatting with us. It's been great to talk to you, and I'll certainly be looking forward to reading more of your books. Thank you. And Thank you. Um, thanks for the people who joined in and with their questions. Okay, everyone. How I just want to wish you all a happy um, 2023 and enjoy your reading because books are awesome. Mm. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>